Hello and welcome to the 249th episode of the Board Game Barrage podcast, a podcast about board games, the latest hotness, how to have fun with your friends even when you're losing. I am Kellen the Green Tank and I do not have a lisp and I am introducing Mark and Neelan who also do not have a lisp. Yeah. Say hello. Hello. Uh, probably one of the weirdest reviews we've ever had. We're all lisp free. <laughs> as they say in the business. Yeah. I don't know, like there's some training to be corrected of lisps. Yeah. Um but you won't find any of those here only some french fry but here we go today on the board game barrage podcast we are going to be talking about the essence of essex of no, <laughs> yep the essence of excess uh, can you guys say that five times fast essence of excess essence of excess essence of excess excess in board game production in board games in general but before we do that we're going to talk about the games that we have been playing Neelan is going to kick us off with Habitats. I am going to update us, update us, update you on some plays of Twilight Inscription, Blood on the Clock Tower, and Mark is going to take us to the midway point with the coverage of It's a Wonderful Kingdom. I feel like It's a Wonderful World, right? Rolls off the tongue. It's a Wonderful Kingdom doesn't roll anywhere. Am yeah. I wrong? Wait to part three is it's a wonderful locale, <laughs> which is even more clunky, but got to keep the theme going. Is that real? No, it is not real. <laughs> oh, oh, you got me. Okay. Neelan, and you'll cut that. Yeah. That, no, that won't. Yeah. Where I don't get got. So yeah, do, that's sort of rule number one. Canonical. <laughs> yeah, we always right. cut the stuff that makes you look silly. Th- yeah, that's true. Uh, Neelan, why don't you tell us about Habitats? Yeah, Habitats is a reprint of a 2016 game. This reprint is coming to us from BoardGameTables.com. They, with the both website and name all in one, and the designer, or the original designer of this is Corne van Moersel, a name that I immediately recognized as someone of the very least, if not South African, then Dutch heritage, which he very much is. Habitats is the game that inspired Uwe's recent digression into these tile-laying puzzle goal fulfillment games. So Nova Luna was the one that sort of caught our attention the earliest. The Sagani and Framework being the latest of these. But Habitats is supposedly the game he played that inspired all of this. In Habitats, what you're doing is you're building Habitats. So you're going to be drafting tiles, each of which has a different land type on them. So that whether drafting that's... tiles, Neon? Well, that we'll does get there. a disservice we'll to get the there. thematics. We'll, we'll what get What do you mean? There. You're not drafting tiles. You're driving a truck through the savanna and kidnapping animals. Okay, well, there's that. Kellen couldn't help himself. The mechanism by which you are taking these tiles is exactly that. You have this lovely grid of tiles and animals and flowers and all sorts of terrain types. And your little truck meeple, you're going to move that on your turn through the habitats so you drive forward you drive left you drive right you take the tile that you land on you put it in your little tableau and you pass it to the next player and they look at what just got put down they think oh i want to sort of start heading in that direction so there's this element of sort of driving your truck slowly towards the tiles you want hoping that other people don't beat you there while trying to build out your little tableau of habitats and this is just like an interconnected, you know, these are square tiles that are just going to fit orthogonally adjacent to each other into a growing grid of tiles. And what you're trying to do is build out little regions of similar terrain to create habitats. Why? Because let's say I took a tile of a giraffe. That giraffe wants to be next to you, or at least connected to three grasslands. And it also wants to be connected to water. And it also wants to be connected to the savanna. So how do you satisfy that? You get it adjacent to a grassland tile, and if that grassland tile is itself connected to more tiles, then they all count as satisfying the needs of that giraffe. So if this giraffe needs three grass, one water, one savanna, and you have a big three-sized grassland connected to it, touching it, that giraffe is super happy. He loves to be there. Once you've satisfied all of his needs, that giraffe is now going to be scoring you points at the end of the game. So all of this is going to sound super familiar if you played Nova Luna. That's kind of where that game begins and ends. But what's a little bit interesting about Habitats is it actually has more systems layered onto it in terms of scoring. It has goals that you're going to be competing for at the end of every year. There's three years in the game. 
X number of tournaments in each of them, depending on the player count. And once you get to the end of those years, you're going to evaluate two goals and whoever has the highest value in those goals is going to be scoring some more points. There are different types of tiles. So unlike Sagani, unlike Nova Luna, there are flowers, there are animals, there are camps that just need tiles adjacent to them. There are watchtowers that want to score based on how many other animals are around them. So the different relative values of each of these things you're going to collecting and how they're going to sort of work into your strategy gives you a lot more variance, a lot more options in sort of how you can play it out. For instance, in the game that we played, I ended up having a lot of gates in my park and that worked out very, very well for me. One of the things that makes this really, really stand out, at least the edition we played, because we have the <laughs> deluxe edition of this. This has, for every single animal in the game, a unique little wooden meeple that when you satisfy that tile, you hunt for that animal in this mess of wooden pieces and place it on your little park. And it ends up making it like this lovely little visual thing. I mean, it's a very vibrant, colorful game. Each of these habitats has bright, distinct colors. And the puzzle of building out your park is is very satisfying. Nova Luna is one of my absolute favorite games. And this the puzzle is not lost here. Despite this feeling like Nova Luna with more stuff, it's still very satisfying. Callum, what was your take on habitats? So this has been on my radar for a number of years, probably as many years it's been out. So if we wanted to count those years, that would be... 2022, 2021, 2020, 2019, 2018. Wait, sorry, I lost count. What were we at? 2017. Don't forget 2017. Oh, you got it. Okay, good. 2016, so seven years, as sort of a underrated or like a lot of people, even though it's in the sevens, a lot of people like say this is my favorite tile lane game or this is like me and my wife play this game the most. It has really cute animals in it. It has a a bit of a clever puzzle in it. But with that said, it wasn't enough for me personally to break out of, you know, I don't really like solo tile placement type games. I think Nova Luna, you know, for me, for me and my money and my house, I would say it's Nova Luna, then probably Habitats for me, then Sagani, then Framework if I'm ranking them. Nova Luna just distills it down. Habitats is just, and let's not even start on these meeples that come with the game. Literally, there's like over 80 animals, Mark, and each one has a unique wooden animeeple. And it was 30 extra dollars on the Kickstarter to get these. And if you don't have the 30 extra dollars, you just mark it with a chit, like a poor person, (laughs) right? And then if you spend $30, you're a idiot because you have to mark, you have to find it and they're really hard to find. I was in shock. I was in shock on multiple levels. These pieces a, that you're marking, these animal pieces, what do they look like? Are they like three-dimensional animal pieces, tokens? Yeah, you got to look at this, bro. I will, I'll link you right now. So they're not like 3D in the sense of being like miniatures. They're very much wooden meeples, but they're, they're like screen printed, wooden, I guess. Wooden, silk screen. Silk screen, yeah. Meeples, or maybe screen printed. And again, there's like 80 unique animal tiles, and each one has its oh, own wow. meeple. And in the base game, you mark them with one chit that looks the same and in the game where i'm the idiot who spent 30 dollars on this which is me i just couldn't and again here's the other thing right board game tables has these great boxes these don't even fit in the box there's no world there is no world okay i don't know who designed the theory of whatever box sizes it's not possible i'll get a scientist even the base game, like, it's a struggle once you get the bag in there to get the box to close all the way. So, yeah, absolutely forget it once you have these deluxe pieces. Which is actually a cons- pretty consistent problem with, I think, board game tables deluxe versions. Bear Raid has the exact same problem. I do think that it is a nice addition for, you know, it has some of the expansions included in it. Again, I want to try it one more time perhaps but i don't believe it'll be something that i personally will be holding on to i think if you're in the tile laying market you could do a whole hell of a lot worse the artwork is beautiful and i do think there's something there in the gameplay like the only substantive player interaction is using your truck to take an animal before someone else wants it which you know they call it take i call it kidnap tomato <laughs> tomato that is habitats no that's neil yeah, i was going to say okay but here's that. the thing neil is getting to feature the game and I am the idiot who kickstarted the game. <laughs> and then double idiot because I kickstarted the game and I bought these screen printed animeeples. Yeah, I mean, and I appreciate it. Thank you. 
<laughs> and looking at this versus Nova Luna, it feels like at first blush that Nova Luna is sort of like this game, but abstracted, obviously, and sort of simplified both in terms of rules and in terms of like visual presentation and like number of pieces and stuff like that. Is that a fair comparison? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Nova Luna almost completely discards any semblance of theme. And, and yeah, it really kind of just lops off systems. It doesn't have competing goals. It's much closer to being just pure drafting. It, yeah. it does have that like novel patchwork timing system. But yeah, it kind of just reduces systems. Because while this looks totally like beautiful and very colorful and vibrant, and looking at pictures of gameplay... And these pictures don't even include the animeeples that Kellen and you have mentioned. But I can just imagine like having all of that on the board would greatly reduce the ability to sort of see what you have potentially firing off as opposed to Nova Luna where it's just like colors. It's like I need three red and a blue and you look and it seems pretty easy and just seems like this would be more confusing. I don't think that it's too much, Mark, when you're in your tableau, because you're adding one tile to it each turn, and you kind of know what's happening at any point, and then sure. you lock in an animal, and then you cover it up to say, like, this animal is happy. Okay. I will say that, like, in my mind, the substantive specific differentiator, right, not just more complex or less complex, is that in habitats, you have a truck with a sense of direction. And so I do think that Neelan's, like, your drafting tiles is, like, pretty reductive and not actually what it is, which <laughs> to is to say, fair, no, 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 no let me finish there. my sentence. Let me finish my <laughs> sentence. Neelan. Which is that if you're really into, like, forward planning, you know, you could aim your truck in a certain direction and know where that truck is heading. So there's, oh, there's reds over there, over yonder. So if I make a right here for the animal I actually want, I'm going to be hurting some of my future odds. And all of that is, like, absent from Nova Luna. Yeah right? Where it's just the time track or essentially a time track that you're using to pick tiles. Yeah, and I, I think that's actually right, which is to say that I'm actually in this weird place where I'm torn on this versus Nova Luna. And I didn't think that after playing Habitats once. I thought, well, this just feels like Nova Luna with excess. But there are elements to this that are interesting components that I'm actually surprised were taken away, which is exactly that. That this idea of, oh, there's this tile I really, really want, but it's on the other side of this grid of tiles. So that my best case, I need to work my way towards that, but pick up the good stuff along the way. Or you sacrifice that entirely and just say, okay, I'm just going to pick up these better things in the other direction. And that's an interesting decision. That's an interesting decision that doesn't exist in Nova Luna. Yeah, I was hoping that Neelan would actually like it more than he did because it seems to reward more future planning. I just drive my truck at whatever animal is in my line of sight that I want to kidnap most with no thought at, you know, backing into a corner where then you just <laughs> only have one animal option. This is one I, I, I do dig and I'm planning on playing it more and it may end up feeling like the superior game to me. Who can say? Uh, that is Habitats by BoardGameTables.com. Neelan and I played games together, as you might imagine, because he keeps protesting every time I say any sentence. We had a chance over the weekend to play another round of Blood on the Clock Tower. For those keeping track, the tryhards at home, I would estimate that this is my fifth game of Blood on the Clock Tower. If you want the dates that I played those games and with whom I played them with, feel free to email us at boardgamebarrage at gmail.com. Blood on the Clock Tower is the new werewolf social deduction flavor of the month that is delivered to everybody. And we had a fun game. We had a lot of new players playing. I am questioning... My life choices after playing Blood on the Clock Tower. I'm questioning social deduction as a genre of whether or not I even like it. And I'm also questioning whether I should buy Blood on the Clock Tower to host a game for my brother and his friends over the Christmas break. All of those things are true. <laughs> I think that actually this is probably the game that gave me the most doubts about Blood on the Clock Tower the one that we most recently played, I mean. And I think part of what that boils down to is really just one of the questions I was thinking about afterwards is, I know that this probably changes a lot with the player group and with more experience, so, you know, don't at me. But, like, are the good players playing more against the evil players or are they playing more against the puzzle of the game? And some of that puzzle is kind of set in stone at the start by whatever the scenario as dictated by the storyteller. And I don't even mean that in over the course of the game evolving, just literally what roles are in the game and what information they give people at the start. So I felt pretty frustrated by the end of our game where I kind of felt like we couldn't necessarily unpack the logic of the puzzle even without really that much evil interference in a way that just kind of felt hard to parse or hard to know what to do with. 
So in like a very specific way for me, the way that I would articulate this is in a game of Resistance or Secret Hitler, often it gets down to the point where it's very clear to everyone at the table that there's a 66% chance that Neilan is lying and a 50% chance that Kellen is lying. And then we both scream really loudly and see who believes us by looking in our eyes. It's more for me on the table. It's clear the deduction has been done and there isn't a lot of room for people to not get the deduction once you're really experienced. That's my take. In Blood on the Clock Tower, it felt like Neil and I had arrived at like the end of the logic trees, which is unusual for me. And it was really about trying to convince other people that, that we had already arrived there and we could not help them arrive there. And so I didn't feel like there was any more decisions or things that I could do to impact the game. And then the game ended. With that said, it is a fun experience. It is fun time getting to know people. And I was imagining myself over Christmas sort of trying to host a game and, and I could see his friends having fun doing it. So maybe I'll do it. I don't, I'm, I'm going to pitch it to him softly. Well, then again, I may have to steal Neyland's grimoire. Oh, yeah. And it's like, that is a $200 product. I don't know if it'll fit in the back of my RAV4 Prime, but if it does, I may be taking that home for Christmas. And I think just to reiterate something Helen said is despite this being the least good game I've had of it, I had a ton of fun playing it. And it doesn't sour me on the game as an experience at all. I mean, look, every game has good games. Every game has bad games. I still enjoyed the process of playing it. Like, it is very, very unique in that way. I am actually, interestingly, probably going to be firing up my own first attempt at being a storyteller sometime in the near future. So yeah, I'm, I'm keen to see like how that feels as a fit. Interesting that I'm just hearing this now, Neilan. I was just, I, to, I'm, well, I mean, I must you're have not, missed I, my, you're not uninvited. You are definitely invited. It's just like, it's just like invitation. shaped up recently. Straight to spam, you know, <laughs> as they say, or you snail mailed it. So quick question, just so I'm clear, you're saying that in this game of blood on the clock tower, you had nailed down what the situation was, and it was just a matter of getting the other players to follow you down the path? It's so complicated that I feel like the game is more discovery than it is actual social or actual deduction. Like, I did not believe that there was more deduction than Neilan and I could really do at this point, and we were opposed. Oh, so sorry, you're saying that you had gone down this deduction tree, as you said, and that there was nothing more to be gained, and then whatever the solution was, was in some sort of murky area that could not be deduced at all? Yeah, so it was essentially that Neilan and I either pulled off a good move, or an entirely new player had lucked into a really good lie on turn two. Okay. And so I'm evaluating those for like three rounds. There was no further information that really could be gleaned from it. I chose to f*** Neelan because, you know, when in doubt, f*** Neelan. Sure. And I was wrong. And then I was like, oh, okay. You know, and like all the unspringing of that jack-in-the-box, as it were, happened in the first night. And then everything else was just like... Yeah. Perfunctory nothing, after that. Right. Nothing much evolved over the course of the game. And to be fair... That's like a good way to say it. I think largely that was actually for what it's worth, the result of people not just being that talkative in our game, which, you know, will shut down any social deduction game, really. But, you know, still, it's hard not to fault the game to some extent. Gotcha. And so another game, and not and again, I do want to say that my, like, TLDR at the end was, like, I might buy this to run a game of it. So, like, that's not nothing in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, another game that we got to play this weekend was Twilight Inscription, the Twilight Imperium Roll and Write. Thank you again to Casey... Brain in a Jar, who we played this live on stream, if you can believe it. And so we'll put a link to that VOD in the show notes. Look at me. I know what a VOD is. If you don't, that's a video replay of a Twitch stream where you can listen to and watch us play Twilight Inscription. Um, I think that we have talked about Twilight Inscription a few times. I think that this is my first full game. I played a demo game previously. I think that it is (sighs) fine. I think that if you like both Twilight Imperium, the messy, chaotic, crazy, long thing, and you're okay with roll and rights, you will adore Twilight Inscription. I think everyone else should stay away. I think that it, it does what it came to do. It did the impossible. LOL, isn't this a good laugh? Like, we made this happen. But there's, like, significant lack of player interaction. It's very long. It's very static. And I don't find that there would be much differentiation game to game. But again, 
there is something novel about I'm playing a giant space game and all I'm doing is rolling dice and you can play this over the internet without having to even look at each other and there's only like one change that has to happen to not even be in the same room to play it with people. Yeah, this is now my third game of Twilight Inscription, and, and I can sort of see myself reaching the limits of it. I still think it's very good for what it is, and you know, your mileage will definitely vary on how many games makes anything worthwhile to you. But yeah, I do think that that's I'm reaching maybe the same limit that Kellen's alluding to there, which is kind of like once you've played through the game multiple times, you're kind of doing the same thing, just with very, very, very slight variations on that. Uh, and there's not enough player interaction to really vary that up substantively from game to game. So yeah, I think I have a couple more good games of this in me, but so that might be it for me. And there's that group of people who like like Twilight Imperium in spite disliking like player interaction, you know, like they just like the like mess, the chaotic, all the mechanisms thrown in. And so like, I, I do think they've done a laudable job of making something. And I think the sort of fantasy flight everything in the kitchen sink messiness like it doesn't feel that it feels relatively streamlined for what it's trying to be which is a two to three hour roll and write game about emulating the world's longest 4x game yes i know it's not the world's longest 4x game but none of the longer ones are worth mentioning mark yes i was almost gonna like call out mark big knee like don't come at me for that (laughs) sentence (laughs) mark yeah Basada, why don't you tell us about your foray into the kingdom of... Of wonder. Of, thank you. You're welcome. So, I got a chance to play It's a Wonderful Kingdom by Lucky Duck Games and Frederick Gorard. Now, the title, It's a Wonderful Kingdom, might sound familiar, as we've alluded to. In fact, it might sound quite familiar because this is the sequel to a game from a couple of years ago, It's a Wonderful World. I have to say that while I'm not the biggest fan of the dualification of board games, which is to say games having like a two-player implementation come out and it being called so-and-so dual, I think I might prefer that to having the sequel called It's a Wonderful Kingdom, which doesn't really lend any information about what type of game this is in relation to the first one. And in fact, at least for me, made for quite a bit of confusion about the two games together. Like I wasn't sure if this was just like a a second version of it a a re-implementation what it was in relation to the first anyway i mean for what it's worth i'm now realizing for the first time that this is a two-player version of it so yes okay perfect exactly yeah wait what yeah this is a two-player version in a way of it's a wonderful world so i'm glad that there are people who are having the same issue that i had with the naming so yeah this is basically this is it's a wonderful world duel that's the short and sweet title So for those who don't know, It's a Wonderful World is a multiplayer drafting engine building game where the core of the gameplay was you got a hand of cards that all allowed you to build up your engine. You would draft them sort of Seven Wonders style where you pick a card, pass a card, pick a card, pass a card, and you build an engine to produce one of a few different types of resources. Uh, Your engine would fire off in order so that you'd create resource number one and then resource number two and resource number three. And you could do things in such a way that the resources you produce early in a production phase help you construct another part of the engine that would fire off later. The production phase of the game does carry over to It's a Wonderful Kingdom, but the drafting does not carry over. That's where the games change. The drafting mechanism has been replaced with an I split you choose mechanism in It's a Wonderful Kingdom, or as it's, I guess, called in the game, split and and trap. That's what they're calling it, rather than I split you choose. The way that this works, rather than having a, a hand of cards and draft, 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 is that at the beginning of every one of the four rounds that the game lasts, you will draw seven cards from a common deck with your opponent. And in addition to the seven cards, you get one calamity card, which is a card that is purely negative, And whoever takes the card gets a negative four points, which is quite a hit in a game that tends to be fairly low scoring. From those eight cards in your hand, you and your opponent will alternate placing two cards down shared between you. The cards must be placed in one of two piles. So let's call the piles the left pile and the right pile. You can place both of your cards in one pile if you want. You can split them up between the piles. And then your opponent chooses one of the piles. And then your opponent places two cards and then you choose, and so on and so forth. So for example, I might have, for my turn, place one card in the left pile, one card in the right pile, and my opponent takes, say, the right pile, and then on their turn, they place both of their cards in the left pile. So now I can choose between one card on one pile and two cards in the other pile. So it's a game where the number of cards you're going to take per round can be quite even. You can have a situation where one pile has you know, four cards, one pile has one card. You can even get in a situation where one pile has 
you know, say five cards, say three cards, whatever, and another pile has nothing, and you might take the nothing pile because you don't want to take a pile that has calamity cards in it. So there's that to it. That system sounds so silly as to, like, why isn't that in every drafting game? Is that kind of how it felt? Like, it's so straightforward. Yeah, no, it is very, very straightforward. In addition to that, there's one other aspect when it comes to this split and trap mechanism, and this is the trap part of it. So twice per round, so for two of the eight cards that you're placing out, you can place them face down. Six out of the eight cards, you play face up, and both you and your opponent knows what cards constitute the piles. But for two of the cards, you're placing them face down. And so there's the idea that hey, are they placing this card face down because it's a Calamity card and they want me to take it? Or do they know that that's what I'm thinking and therefore they're placing a good card face down and they're trying to warn me off of it because they want to take it later? And so there's that think and double think aspect to it. And so you'll do that until you both have played all eight cards and then you're going to play the cards you've acquired to build your engine. And this works very much like It's a Wonderful World, where the cards you build will produce uh, one of four or five different types of resources that you'll get through your engine. In addition, you can discard the cards you acquire from the game completely. Instead of using them to build up your engine, you can discard them for a single resource that you can place instead. After you have dealt with building your engine, you'll run your engine. And you run it the same way you did in It's a Wonderful World. You'll produce the most common type of resource first and immediately take the resources you've acquired and use them to build the other parts of your engine that you're still under construction. If those parts of your engine that are under construction now get built, you immediately place them into your engine so that you can have it fire off later on in the game. Also, like It's a Wonderful World, whoever creates the most of each individual resource between you and your opponent gets a bonus. In the case of It's a Wonderful Kingdom, the bonus that you're fighting over are soldiers, which can be used to construct some buildings, or they can be spent in different ways depending on the modules that you're playing with. So let's talk really quickly about the modules. There are three types of modules you can play with. One gives you asymmetric powers. One replaces the calamity cards with these like specific monsters that you're trying to get your opponents to take. And then finally, there's a quest module where you can spend your resources in unique ways. And if you don't complete a certain part of the quest, you're not eligible to win the game. They add some complexity and variability to the game. But interestingly, they can't be mixed together. So you can only pick one specific module of any type to add to the game. You can never combine modules, which frankly is fine with me having to decide which combination of modules to play might be a bit of a pain, not to mention a little overwhelming. And it would also make me concerned about if I was playing the game in the ideal way, which is something that Kellen has mentioned before. When you have all these modules, you wonder like, is this the way to play it? So I'm glad that the modules are a little bit curtailed in that way. So that's basically how It's a Wonderful Kingdom works. I think the first thing to say about the game is that while it sounds both in title and in a quick review of the rules like its predecessor, It's a Wonderful World, removing that core mechanism of drafting and replacing it with this split and choose or split and trap system makes it feel a lot different in in actual play. So I'd say that those who who are concerned that there might be too much overlap if they had both games in their collection need not worry at least about that. I know that some who've played this game don't like how confrontational the game is as far as the Calamity cards work, and there's like some concern with the idea that maybe the better bluffer is at an advantage, to which I would say to both those arguments, great, I love that. I like the bluffing, I like the trash talking, and the daring my opponent to take the face down card. The rest of the game, I didn't really love. We've often said that when it comes to an engine building sort of game, We like it when it ends one round too early. The example I always use with this is Marco Polo, where it's a game where you build an engine, you build an engine, you build an engine, and just at the precipice where you have it going, where it's going to fire off and you're going to get a bunch of things, it ends. It's a Wonderful Kingdom feels like it ends maybe two rounds too early. Mm -hmm. You start where you're barely constructing anything, you're barely producing any resources in the first round, and you get a little bit more in the second round, and you get a little bit more in the third round. In the fourth round, you're just starting to get going and the game ends. And the way that the cards work, the way that they're almost all engine building cards made it feel very incremental. So both the way that you're getting very few resources, even in the end of the game where your engine should be at its most robust, and the way that every card is like part of this engine building just made it all feel very incremental, very like mechanical to me in a way that I didn't really love. I've 
played in the It's a Wonderful World a couple times. I have enjoyed that. It hasn't blown me away. I know there are people who like it a great deal. And for those who are interested in playing it, it's available on BGA. But I would say that I greatly prefer It's a Wonderful World to It's a Wonderful Kingdom. The split and choose mechanism, while interesting and while like the, the best part to me, didn't save what felt like a too bitty, too like small of a game. By the time we finished it, it just felt like... We had not really built much of an engine and just didn't feel like satisfying, which is what I want, at least in an engine building, where like at the end of it, you feel like, wow, I've got this thing that I constructed really churning things out. It is a shame about that engine building arc that you described, because I actually do think Wonderful World does actually capture that pretty well, which is it doesn't let you get to the point where you're just in complete excess. Like it does seem to have that tempo like nailed down pretty well. So to hear that they've like completely lost that in wonderful kingdom is is a bummer yeah and and even for as fun to me and as interesting as the hiding cards work this bluffing aspect to it where you potentially hide a card like even that as much as i try to soup it up with like trash talking and all that in the end if your opponent grabs that pile that you didn't want to grab or you end up grabbing a pile you didn't want to grab it doesn't feel that massive like the stakes don't ever really feel high enough to make that bluffing like super interesting so you know you're all fighting over pieces of an engine that in the end isn't going to be like the engine of a 747 it's like you're fighting over the engine of like a moped i do have a question about that so you said you can do this twice twice every turn right or twice around yeah so that would imply that you're pretty much always doing that twice every round but is there anything to go on at all in terms of like what you might be bluffing behind those Not really. I mean, the biggest thing is the idea that your opponent will put a face down card and then there's that initial like think, double think, and then you will wait to see what your opponent does. That's like the biggest thing. Like if you decide to pass on it, fine. And then you see, do they snatch it immediately and you've been fooled or do they avoid it? I'm glad that that kind of paid off for you because my reaction when you described it was that that just felt really arbitrary and wouldn't have done anything for me personally. Yeah. And I can see that. I know a lot of people have not enjoyed it, both for the confrontational, like sort of take that aggressive aspect of it. And because, as you said, the arbitrariness of it. Yeah. So that is It's a Wonderful Kingdom by Lucky Duck Games and Frederick Garrard. Just a shout out here in the mid cap to a special Patreon bonus episode that we are releasing this month. Live at Shucks, we recorded a panel with our friends at so very wrong about games that panel was on the hidden biases that you may not realize when you're listening to board game reviewers and board game media we got really specific because we thought that it would only be at the panel but here we are releasing it as a patreon bonus episode so if you're not a patron of the show you can do that at patreon.com slash board game barrage and the october episode will be that panel so we're excited to uh, put that out into the wild Here we are, boys. It is time for the hot question. Neelan? The uh, hot question. He's back. Hello. Wow. Every time, Neelan, you get me. Just, I just want to say, I admire you. (laughs) Uh, you. Today's hot question is, what is the best example that you can think of of excess in board game production? The most excessive board game production or component or however you want to answer this it's the essence of excess nailed it specifically the pronunciation not the question (laughs) one good example of this to me was very recent just yesterday in fact where i opened up my box of iss vanguard this is a very elaborate kickstarter fulfilled by awakened realms they're the people that made tainted grail and lords of hellas And they're very much known for these elaborate sort of minis productions. But while the minis were an option that, of course, I went for, that wasn't what was excessive about this box. Even just the base box of this, while having a handful of minis in it, is just layered with just lovely, lovely little produced components. Whether it's like the rule book that has one of the most luxury looking bindings to it, or this giant sort of ring binder that's in there that is like printed on the inside and out and has like custom card sleeves that have been printed for like the various ship upgrades that go into this custom little plastic card holders that are just for dispensing cards to each of the players it it was a lot it was almost like a a christmas present of just pulling things out of this box and going "Ooh, i've never seen that before Ooh, i've never seen that before it was very cool 
it's like Neon, when I think of excess, right, which I can't pronounce, excess, uh-huh. excess, you, when you described this to me the other day, like you were like, I felt like a child again. It, it, that like was the it. The childlike wonder, the beauty of being, you know, young again and not old and jaded like you are now. <laughs> like, is is this excess, has it made itself worthwhile to you? Yeah, well, like I You're mean, happy about its excess. I mean, I think that to some extent, like excess, this is like maybe the crux of what could be like a discussion on this, right? Which is like, is excess good i mean i think the traditional answer is no almost by definition of the word but i'm not gonna lie like this worked its magic on me it made me feel like a little bit like i shouldn't be enjoying it as much as i was but i I was you were loving it (laughs) it felt a little bit like when you're eating fast food you're eating your favorite burger and fries and a milkshake and as you're getting it down you know this is bad you can feel it's bad but god it tastes so good it's like crazy how that that's a line right and yeah. somehow like you're right on the right yeah. side of the line you know we were at a friend's house this weekend and i say that like neil and now weekend and they have the too many bones i don't know what this is but it takes up an entire calyx shelf isn't it called like a bones. treasure trove i think it's like something. it it what well, i don't might be because you need <laughs> magnets like you take off the top and then there's like a giant magnet thing that you use to open like compartments in it. Like you can't open, you don't think about opening those compartments with your hands. Dear God, no, you use this like magnetic, like door opener to like get everything out. It's like a mini calyx in your calyx Mm -hmm. for one game. And I just was like, my eyes were wide open and, and to me too excessive again, but maybe if I loved too many bones, which I have not tried, or it was like a Dune product, I guess, or a Pokemon product, then, you know, it's right on the perfect side of excessive. What's funny, actually, is that chip theory themselves, they do excess even in their base games, right? So this was like a layer of excess on the ordinary amount of excess that is a chip theory game. Chip theory who refuse cardboard at all costs and will replace everything cardboard with neoprene. Right. It's funny because my gut feeling when it came to thinking about where the line was when it comes to something being like fun versus excessive was like, okay, well, if you like the game, it's going to be fun. And if you don't like the game, it's going to be excessive. But then almost immediately, I found like counter arguments to both that in my own mind. So examples of excessive that I liked in a game that I like is the um, Anachrony Exosuits. So for those who don't know, Anachrony is a worker placement game. And if you have the Exosuit edition, instead of just placing your little chits, cardboard chits on the areas that you want to place your workers, you place those chits in this plastic mold of a three-dimensional exosuit and you place that on the board. And it's completely unnecessary. But for whatever reason, like I've played the game both with and without it. And I just enjoy it so much more when I have the exosuits. It just feels like a completely different yeah. experience. I'd be to go as far as saying that you're not playing anachrony unless you're playing it. With I think you're right. I mean, it's silly oh to say my that. God. It's silly <laughs> to say that, Which- but- is a disgusting thing to say. And yes, I'm sorry agreed. to anyone that loves Anachrony and doesn't have the minis, but yeah. But get the minis. No, I'm just kidding. Do, no, that is that is not the position of Board Game Barrage. And then, for example, on the other side, a game that has an excessive part to it that I don't really like is the Tree in Everdale, which is something that people will cite all over the place, where it's like it almost, almost like an obstruction. I recently got a chance to play Everdale for the first time, and yes, that tree is annoying. I didn't really even love the game, but the tree is just like in the way, and it just doesn't serve like any productive purpose i guess it adds a little bit of theme but it just was an attraction but on the other hand millennium blades the wads of cash in millennium blades where you could just have like a single bill that said a thousand dollars or whatever like you would get in monopoly or any game that paper money but in millennium blades every unit of currency is a wad of cash that has like a rubber band in the middle and you just feel like you've got these like big loads of cash and whenever you make any deal no matter how small it is or buy any card in that game you're using this big wad of cash and despite the fact that i don't really love millennium blades that wad of cash always strikes me as a fun part as like a extravagance that helps the game or it helps my enjoyment and then on the other side finally a game that i do like where the extravagance is annoying to me is the come on version of council of four council of four is a game that i enjoy i enjoyed the pre simon version which was like a pretty bog standard brown euro sort of thing simon acquired the rights to the game and launched their own version which was just the art was a little too garish and the big thing is that each player had this like big sculpt or this big mini that represented their character that had absolutely no effect on gameplay you didn't even place them on the board you just like had them 
chilling next to you when you played and it served no purpose. So despite the fact that I do like Council of Four, the Simon overproduction still bugs me whenever I played. I prefer to play the old brown Euro. It is um, really interesting to think about XS as like just the line by which, you know, on one side it's cool and on one side it's not. Even the dice in Twilight Inscription are delightfully large and sort of translucent and shiny. But I could see a world where if they were like half again as big, bigger, they would be like excessive to me. But like where they're at is totally fine, even though you could shrink them by 50% and they would still function identically. I think this question comes to us, to me, as a result of playing Habitats, which I literally believe could be the most egregious. Like, it's insane. Apparently, the old edition of Habitats, an animal was unfulfilled and you had it on its back and then you flipped it over. So even the system in the game of just marking it with a chit when you've completed it is a little bit like uncouth or it feels a little unfinished. And then when I realized what was happening, like I didn't know the game, you know, and I'm like learning the rules, nothing fits in the box. And I'm like, they actually expect you to like look through 80 animals and they're separated in bags by like color, right? But the color doesn't correspond to anything gameplay related. So it's like, you're like, okay, I'm looking for an alligator. And then everyone at the table is like, okay, what color is the alligator? And you're like, well, it's orangish yellow. <laughs> and then you're literally just looking through bags for alligators. And it's like, is this an ostrich or is it a crane? And like people are legitimately having to negotiate and figure out if they have the right animal token. And then it, the, the fact that it was like almost as expensive as the game, $39 for the game, $30 for these animeeples and that it doesn't fit in the box it like would double the size of the box i can't believe they even offered it and i can't believe that i purchased it again actually no me above them i can't believe i purchased it and i can't believe it's offered <laughs> the other thing that you know we just talked about last week or the week before with puzzle strike 2 like literally half the game box contains a plastic scepter like it's literally half the game box is a plastic scepter that lights up that you hold to say that you're the leader. Literally, it could be a chit and it would have the same effect on the game. And so it's just like, it probably raised the price a couple of bucks. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how board game production works. It takes up half the box. You have to use a tray. Like the whole thing is just obscene. And I mean, again, I like the... Yeah, but how would it have affected your enjoyment of the game if that had been a chit, do you think? If that had been a chit and the box was smaller, I would have liked the game more personally. <laughs> but but again, and I like the game. Yeah. So there is some... Again, I guess maybe if you could hold the scepter while you were playing. <laughs> right. on, I'm, I'm being no, totally straight right oh, now. Oh, like the ring in, um, yes, in nothing, nothing personal. personal. Yeah. That's right. When you're the capo, when you're the big bad boss and nothing personal, you wear a ring and you. I think you break ties and you sort of kind of don't around and find out and you can flash the ring that you're wearing right yeah with the scepter of power it is a little bit of the same system where like don't you dare but like the idea that like neilan is gonna like pick up the scepter and sort of like wag it at me i don't know to sort of like proclaim his power it's just like it just sits next to you takes up space has a battery it's like <laughs> it's just excessive yeah well i think we're gonna go out on top uh everyone keep that visual of neilan wagging a princess scepter that's sort of lit up and glowing at me and saying, you know, what is it? I'm the leader. I don't know what you are in the game. We've never asked for fan art, but... Oh, if that's wants to, true. Yeah, if someone wants to draw that, I'd be 100% down. And even though that I wasn't part of the game, I would like to be painted or drawn or whatever medium you In the use. scene. Yeah, in the scene, like maybe behind the two of you, sort of like judgmental, like looking at <laughs> yeah. you like... Yeah, maybe you're the king and we're fighting over your favor, you know, yeah. with the with the pink scepter. I love it. That is going to do it for this episode of the Board Game Barrage podcast. You can reach out to us and talk to us. Probably the easiest place is Discord at boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord. But we have a Board Game Geek Guild. You can find us there. You can email us at boardgamebarrage at gmail.com. You can support us on Patreon for more shenanigans and hijinks. Thank you so much to Heart Society Music for their fantastic song, What's on your mind, kid, from their album, Wake the Queens. And until next time, good evening and good night. Good night. Bye-bye. That's the one. 2.49, huh? Oh, Neilan's getting the one.
Yeah, I always get the best numbers. <laughs> That's what we've always said. All right, so we're going to go three, two, one? Yep. Yes. Three, two, one. What's the over-under on that one? Pretty good? Last week's was really, like, perfect. Last week's seemed like the worst one to me, That's but uh, I think it'll be fine, as last week's was fine. They're all fine. <laughs> They're always fine. We're so in sync that even the smallest variance sounds really bad, but in fact, we are like within milliseconds of each other. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. I am always wanting to make in sync and Backstreet Boys jokes anytime someone says the word like Backstreet or someone says yeah. the word in sync. Yeah, people say I... Backstreet all the time. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, I get, then I get confused and I'm like... Damn it, which one is bye bye bye? You know, like, does it work <laughs> now? And then if I say it, and so sometimes I think, well, if I just say it confidently enough, then yeah. people will get the reference, even though, like, oh, he's making a twist. You know, he should be quoting, you know, Backstreet Boys, but it's, he's actually quoting, you know, 98 Degrees. Right, right, right. You see what I'm saying? I like that. Was Five ever a big band here? No, I've never heard of Five. Never heard of them. But like, with the, the numeral Five I V E. Oh, that one. No, that one. They were huge here. What are you- no, uh, they weren't. Oh, uh, they're the spelling didn't throw they, no, I thought they were American. I thought they were American, but they're not. They're English. They're very, very English. Never mind. This is Neilan's band from like <laughs> middle school. Yeah, asked, trying this to is, get us. This is my Backstreet Boys. Neilan asked if five was popular here. We say no, and then he's like, "No, no, it's spelled with a five first, and then I." Yeah, yeah. Well, that's just in case you were sure. Like you confuse it with all the other boy bands named five. Right. Right. All right. You guys got to stop with the digressions. <laughs> we gotta get in sync here. And uh, hello, I want everybody and, now. Oh, oh, together. Hello and welcome. Oh, I thought we were okay. Hello and welcome to the two hundred and forty ninth episode of the Board Game.